let's talk about a game. I mean, one of the greatest games ever made. I know you could talk about doing Quake and so on, but to me, Wolfenstein 3D was like, whoa. It, it blew my mind that a world like this could exist. So how did Wolfenstein 3D come to be uh, in terms of the programming, in terms of the design, in terms of some of the memorable technical challenges? Um, and also, actually, just something you haven't mentioned is, you know, how did these ideas come to be inside your mind? The adaptive side-scrolling, so, so the solutions to these technical challenges. So I usually can introspectively pull back pretty detailed uh, accounts of how technology solutions and design choices on my part came to be, where uh, technically we had done two games, 3D games like that before, where Hover Tank was the first one which had flat shaded walls but did have the scaled enemies inside it, and then Catacombs 3D, which had textured walls, scaled enemies, and uh, some more... Uh, some more functionality, like the disappearing walls and some other stuff. But what's really interesting from a game development standpoint is those games, Catacombs 3D, Hover Tank, and Wolfenstein, they literally used the same code for a lot of the character behavior that a 2D game that I had made earlier called Catacombs did, where it was an overhead view game, kind of like Gauntlet. You're running around and you can open up doors, pick up items, basic game stuff. And the thought was that this exact same game experience just presented in a different perspective. It could be literally the same game, just with a different view into it, would have a dramatically different impact on the players. So it wasn't it wasn't a true 3D. You're saying that you the could game, kind of fake it. You can like scale enemies, meaning things that are farther away, you can make them smaller. So from the, the game was a 2D map. Like all of our games use the same tool for creation. We use the same map editor for creating Keen as Wolfenstein and Hover Tank and Catacombs and all this stuff. So the game was a 2D grid uh, made out of blocks. And you could say, well, these are walls. These are where the enemies start. Then they start moving around. And these early games like Catacombs, you played it strictly in a 2D view. It was a scrolling 2D view, and that was kind of using an adaptive tile refresh at the time to be able to do something like that. And then the thought that these early games, all it did was take the same basic enemy logic, but instead of seeing it from the God's eye view on top, you were inside it and turning from side to side, yawing your view and moving forwards and backwards and side to side. Uh, and it's a striking thing where you always talk about wanting to isolate and factor changes in values. And this was one of those most pure cases there where the rest of the game changed very little. It was our normal kind of change the colors on something and draw a different picture for it, but it's kind of the same thing. But the perspective changed in a really fundamental way, and it was dramatically different. I can remember the reactions where the artist, uh, Adrian, that had been drawing the pictures for it. We had a cool big troll thing in Catacombs 3D, and we had uh, these walls that you could get a key and you could make the blocks disappear. Again, really simple stuff. Blocks could either be there or not there. So our idea of a door was being able to make a set of blocks just disappear. Mm -hmm. And I remember the reaction where he had drawn these characters and he was slowly moving around. And like people had no experience with 3D navigation. It was all still keyboard. We didn't even have mice uh, set up at that time. But slowly moving, going up picked up a key, go to a wall. The wall disappears in a little animation and there's a monster like right there. And he practically fell out of his chair. It was just like, ah! And games just didn't do that. You know, the games were the God's eye view. You were a little invested in your little guy. You can be like, you know, happy or sad when things happen, but you just did not get that kind of startle reaction. You weren't inside something is the your game. Face, something in the back of your brain, some yeah. reptile brain thing is just going, oh shit, something just happened. And that was one of those early points where it's like, yeah, this is going to make a difference. This is going to be powerful and it's going to matter. Were you able to imagine that in the idea stage or no? So not that exact thing. So again, we had cases like the arcade games, Battlezone and Star Wars that you could kind of see a 3D world and things coming at you and you get some sense of it, but nothing had done the kind of worlds that we were doing and the sort of action-based things. 3D at the time was really largely about the simulation thoughts. Mm -hmm. And this is something that really might have trended differently if not for the id software approach in the games where there were 
flight simulators. There were driving simulators. You had like hard drive-in and uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. And these were doing 3D and general purpose 3D in ways that were more flexible than what we were doing with our games. But they were looked at as simulations. They weren't trying to necessarily be fast or responsive uh, or letting you do kind of exciting maneuvers because they were trying to simulate reality and they were taking their cues from the big systems, the Evans and Sutherlands and the Silicon Graphics that were doing things. But we were taking our cues from the console and arcade games. You know, we wanted things that were sort of quarter eaters that were doing fast paced things that you could smack you around rather than just smoothly gliding you from place to place. So quarter eaters. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the funny thing is yeah. so much that that built into us that Wolfenstein still had lives and you had like one of the biggest power ups in all these games like was an extra life because you started off with three lives and you lose your lives and then it's game over and there weren't save games in uh, in most of this stuff. It was it sounds almost crazy to say this, but it was an innovation in Doom to not have lives. You know, you could just play Doom as long as you wanted. You just restart at the the start of the level. And why not? This is like, we we aren't trying to take people's quarters. They've already paid for the entire game. We want them to have a a good time. And you would have some, uh, you know, some old timer purist that might think that there's something to the epic journey of making it to the end, having to restart all the way from the beginning after a certain number of tries. But now more fun is had when you just let people kind of keep trying when they're stuck rather than having to go all the way back and and learn different things. So, so you've recommended the book, Game Engine Black Book, Wolfenstein 3D for technical exploration of the game. So looking back 30 years, what are some memorable technical innovations that made this perspective shift into this world that's so immersive that scares you when a monster mm -hmm. appears? What were some things you had to solve? So one of the interesting things that come back to the theme of deadlines and resource constraints, the, the game Catacombs 3D, um, we shipped, we were supposed to be shipping this for Gamer's Edge on a monthly cadence, and I had slipped. I was actually late. It slipped like six weeks because this was texture mapped walls doing stuff that I hadn't done before. And at the six week point, it was still kind of glitchy and buggy. There were things that I knew that if you had a wall that was like almost edge on, you could slide over to it and you could see some things freak out or vanish or not right. work. And I hated that. I, I, but I was up against the wall. We had to ship the game. Uh, it was still a lot of fun to play. It was novel. Nobody had seen it. It gave you that startle reflex uh, reaction. So it was worth shipping, but it had these things that I knew were kind of flaky and janky and not uh, not what I was really proud of. So one of the, the things that I did very differently in Wolfenstein uh, was I went, Catacombs used almost a conventional thing where you had segments that were one-dimensional polygons, basically, that were clipped and, uh, and back-faced and done kind of like a very crude 3D engine from the professionals. But I wasn't getting it done right. I, I was not doing a good enough job. I didn't really have line of sight to, um, to fix it right. There's stuff that, of course, I look back, it's like, oh, it's obvious how to do this, do the math right, do your clipping right, uh, check all of this, how you handle the precision. But I did not know how to do that at that time. And was I, that the first 3D engine you wrote, Catacombs 3D? And Hover Tank had been a little bit before that, but that had the flat shaded walls. So the texture mapping on the walls was what was bringing in some of these challenges that was uh, that was hard for me, and I couldn't solve it right at the time. Can you describe what flat shading is and texture mapping? So in the the walls were solid color, one of sixteen colors uh, in Hover Tank. So that's easy; it's fast. You just draw the solid color for everything. Texture mapping is what we all see today, where you have an image that is stretched and distorted onto the walls or the surfaces that you're working with. Um, and it was, you know, it was a long time for me to just figure out how to do that without it distorting in the wrong ways. And and I did not get it all exactly right in catacombs. And I I had these flaws. So that was important enough to me that rather than continuing to bang my head on that when I wasn't positive I was going to get it. I went with a completely different approach for drawing, for figuring out where the walls were, which was a ray casting approach, which I had done in Catacombs 3D. I had a bunch of C code trying to make this work right, and it wasn't working right. 
In Wolfenstein, I wound up going to a very small amount of assembly code. So in some ways, this should be a slower way of doing it. But by making it a smaller amount of work that I could more tightly optimize, it worked out. And Wolfenstein 3D was just absolutely rock solid. You know, it was, you know, nothing glitched in there. The game just was pretty much flawless through all of that. And I was super proud of that. I'm um, but eventually, like in the later games, I went back to the more span-based things where I could get more total efficiency once I really did figure out how to do it. So there were two sort of key technical things to Wolfenstein. One was this ray casting approach, which you still, to this day, you see people go and say, let's write a ray casting engine because it's an understandable way of doing things that lets you make games very much like that. So you see raycasters in JavaScript, raycasters in Python, people that are are basically going and re-implementing that uh, that approach to to taking a tiled world and casting out into it. It works pretty well, but it's not the fastest way of doing it. Can you describe what raycasting is? So you start off and you've got your screen, which is 320 pixels across at the time if you haven't sized down uh, in the window for, for greater speed. And at every pixel, there's going to be an angle from you've got your position in the world, and you're going to just run along that angle and keep going until you hit a block. So up to 320 times across there, it's going to throw a cast array out into the world from wherever your origin is until it runs into a wall, and then it can figure out exactly where on the wall uh, it hits. The performance challenge of that is, as it's going out, every block it's crossing, it checks, is this a solid wall? Mm -hmm. So that means that in like the early Wolfenstein levels, you're in a small jail cell going out into a small hallway. It's super efficient for that because you're only stepping across three or four blocks. But then if somebody makes a room that covers, our maps were limited to 64 by 64 blocks. If you made one room that was nothing but walls at the far space, it would go pretty slow because it would be stepping across 80 tile tests or something along the way. By the way, the physics of our universe seems to be computing this very thing. So this maps nicely mm -hmm. to the, the actual physics of our world. Yeah, you get, Intuitively. Like, I follow a little bit of something like Stephen Wolfram's work on, uh, you know, interconnected network information states of that. And that's, it's beyond what I can have an informed opinion on, but it's interesting that people are considering things like that and have, uh, and have things that can back it up. Yeah, that's, yeah, there's whole different sets of interesting stuff there. So Wolfenstein 3D had ray casting. So the ray casting, and then the other kind of key aspect was what I called compiled scalers, where the idea of, uh, you saw this in the earlier classic arcade games like Space Harrier and stuff, where you would take a picture, which is normally drawn directly on the screen, and then if you have the ability to make it bigger or smaller, big chunky pixels or fizzly small drop sampled pixels, uh, that's the fundamental aspect of what our characters were doing in these 3D games. You would have, it's just like you might have drawn a tiny little character, but now we can make them really big and make them really small and move it around. Uh, that was the limited kind of 3D that we had for characters. To make them turn, there were literally eight different views of them. You didn't actually have a 3D model that would rotate. You just had these cardboard cutouts. But that was good enough for that startle fight reaction, and it was kind of what we had to do, deal with there. So a straightforward approach to do that, you could just write out your doubly nested loop of uh, you've got your stretch factor and it's like you've got a point, you stretch by a little bit, it might be on the same pixel, it might be on the next pixel, it might have skipped a pixel. Um, you can write that out, but it's not going to be fast enough where especially you get a character for that right in your face, monster covering almost the entire screen, doing that with a general purpose scaling routine would have just been much too slow. It would have worked when they're small characters, but then it would get slower and slower as they got closer to you until right at the time when you most care about having a fast reaction time, the game would be chunking down. So the fastest possible way to draw pixels at that time was to, um, instead of saying, I've got a general purpose, I am version that can handle any scale, I made, I, I used a program to make essentially a hundred or more separate little programs that was optimized for, I will take an image and I will draw it 12 pixels tall. I'll take an image, I'll draw it 14 pixels tall, up by every two pixels even for that. So you would have the most optimized code so that in the normal case where most of the world is fairly large. I uh, like the, the pixels are big. You know, we did not have a lot of memory. So in most cases, that meant that you would load a pixel color and then you would store it multiple times. 
-hmm. So that was faster than even copying an image in a normal conventional case, because most of the time the image is expanded. So instead of doing one read, one write for a simple copy, you might be doing one read and three or four writes as it got really big. And that had the beneficial aspect of just when you needed the performance most, when things are covering the screen, it was giving you the most acceleration for that. By the way, were you able to uh, understand this through thinking about it or were you testing like the right speed and like- So uh, this again comes back to, I can find the antecedents for things like this. So in I, back in the Apple II days, I, the graphics were essentially single bits at a time and if you wanted to make your little spaceship, if you wanted to make it smoothly go across the world, if you just took the image and you drew it out at the next location, you would move by seven pixels at a time. So it would go chunk, chunk, chunk. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to make it move smoothly, you actually had to make seven versions of the ship that were pre-shifted. You could write a program that would shift it dynamically, but on a one megahertz processor, that's not going anywhere fast. So if you wanted to do a smooth moving, fast action game, you made separate versions of each of these uh, sprites. Now, there were a few more tricks you could pull that if it still wasn't fast enough, you could make a compiled shape where instead of this program that normally copies an image and says like, get this byte from here, store it here, get this byte, store this byte. If you've got the memory space you could say, I'm going to write the program that does nothing but draw this shape. It's going to be like, I'm going to load the immediate value 25, you know, which is some bit pattern, and then I'm going to store that at this location. Uh, rather than loading something from memory that re involved indexing registers and this other slow stuff, you could go ahead and say, no, I'm going to hard code the exact values of all of the image right into the program. Now, this was always a horrible trade-off there because you didn't have much memory and you didn't have much speed. But if you had something that you wanted to go really fast, you could turn it into a program. And that was, you know, knowing about that technique is what made me think about some of these unwinding it for the PC, where people that didn't come from that background were less likely to think about that. I mean, there's some deep parallels probably to human cognition as well. There's something about optimizing and compressing the the processing of a new information that requires you to predict the possible ways in which the game or the world might unroll and you have something like compiled scalers always there. So you have, to, you have like optima, like you have a prediction of how the world will unroll and you have some kind of optimized data structure for that prediction. And then you can modify if the world turns out to be different, you can modify in a slight way. And as far as building out techniques, so, you know, so much of the brain is about the associative context. You know, they're just, when you learn something, it's in the context of something else. Mm -hmm. And you can have faint, tiny little hints of things. And I do think there are some deep things uh, you know, around like sparse distributed memories and boosting that it's like, if you can just be slightly above the noise floor of having some hint of something, mm -hmm. you can have things refined into pulling the memory back Back up. So having a being a programmer and having a toolbox of like all of these things that things that I did in all of these previous lives of programming tasks, that still matters to me about how I'm able to pull up some of these things. Like in that case, it was something I did on the Apple II then being relevant for the PC. And I have still cases when I would when I would work on mobile development, then be like, okay, I I did something like this back in the the Doom days, but now it's a different environment. But I has still had that tie. I can bring it in and I can transform it into what the world needs right now. And I, I do think that's actually one of the very core things with human cognition and brain like I, uh, you know, brain like functioning is finding these ways about you've got your brain is kind of everything everywhere all at once. You know, it's, it is just a set of all of this stuff that is just fetched back by these queries that go into it. And they can just be slightly above the noise floor with random noise in your neurons and synapses that are affecting exactly what gets pulled up. So you're saying some of these very specific solutions for different games, you find that there's a kernel of an, a deep idea that's generalizable to other to other things. Yeah, you can't predict what it's going to be, but the, that it's idea there. of like, I called out that compiled shaders uh, in the forward that I wrote for that, uh, the Game Engine Black Book, as, you know, this is, 
It's kind of an endpoint of unrolling code, but that's one of those things that thinking about that and having that in your mind, and I'm sure there are some programmers that you know hear about that, think about it a little bit, it's kind of the mind-blown moment. It's like, oh, you can just turn all of that data into code, and nowadays, you know, you have instruction cache issues, and that's not necessarily the best idea, but there are different... It's an idea that has power and has probably relevance in some other areas. Maybe it's in a hardware point of view that there's a way you approach building hardware that has that same, you don't even have to think about iterating, you just bake everything all the way into it in one place. 